Welcome to Vermont House Transportation Committee. It is Tuesday, Wednesday, April 6th, 2022. It's a little bit after one. We just had lunch. We're coming back. We're going to hear right now from our ledge council who's going to walk us through the, the uh, proposed language from Representative Smith on the distractive driving. We have Anthea with us for about an hour and a half. Then we have a moment, then we go to the floor at three. Life takes another turn. We don't come back after that today. Tomorrow at nine, we have, I forget. That's what, I'll worry about that one. Yeah, we, we changed it, I think. Okay. Perhaps Commissioner Melody makes it at nine? Yeah. <laughs> on the distractive driving my, my and others. Is in the building now. He's coming to explore at 10.15. At 10? 10.15. Oh, good. So tomorrow morning looks like it'll be all in response to, which is why I'm really grateful that we could have Anthea come and do the walkthrough of the bill first for the proposed language before we hear all the other testimony. And then tomorrow afternoon, we will have Anthea back at one o'clock to take a look at uh, new language, which I think is in your inbox, which I haven't seen yet on um, bike ed. And then we go to the floor. Okay, and then we have a testimony coming in Friday after the floor, which I hope is not too long. They can't, now they can't come. So like, oh, they can't come. All right, so we don't process. All right, we'll worry about that one in a minute. But right now, Anthea, why don't you join us? And while you're getting ready, I went over before we went to lunch with uh, our assistant here on um, we have left to hear from testimony on 280 as proposed in front of us. We've gotten an email back from the, the city's attorney in Burlington. The Commerce Committee is going to be taking testimony from DMV. Burlington and uh, uh, the representative that's representing Uber in the, and he will get back to us next week. So uh, the, the other areas I think we are done with except for towing and we can start to send those on to the committees of jurisdiction, which, and then in the towing, we're in the process of scheduling DMV to come in to talk about that funding situation that was funny and the rental company's representative to talk about abandoned rental cars. And that is all I have for the current bill. Yes, ma'am. And House Commerce is hearing about the TNC sunset provision on Friday. Excellent. And so they, they'll get back to us next week sometime, they said. Okay. So what I'd love to start with before we get into destructive driving them, because you're with us and I appreciate it. Because okay. you know, the Senate has great need for you as well. There's a couple of places where I think that we're done with what we want to take for testimony. We haven't made a decision, but I think we're ready to send it off to the other committees. Okay. So if I could ask you, take section two and three, which is the total abstinence program and send that to judiciary. Say, thank you very much. We hope you would take this into consideration and let us know within the next week or two if it's possible. And then section four, which is the overweight permit or to, we're thinking ag and, and commerce might want to see. And um, House Ways and Means heard about sections four, six, and seven. Okay. Kind of, and Chris and I were. And Ways and Means. So section four to commerce and ag. Yeah. And then section five is the bonding, the title bonding. I don't think anybody else is interested unless somebody hears something i think we're 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 gonna we don't need to send that one off the purchase and use section six and seven they have right yeah so the means have i did a walk through of four six and seven and then i talked about sections two and three just because they wanted to know about anything else that was interesting in the bill and i think we actually talked about the total absence program for as long as we talked about the milk collar program wow <laughs> and then the towing 
I don't think it needs to go to anybody else after we hear. Okay, so then we're wrapping that into its corners. For the sake of Representative Shaw's here, and maybe if somebody else was, I just wanna, I had a conversation, unplanned conversation around possibly planning something fun on April 26th or 27th, depending on what AOT can put together around um, a field trip to possibly, if it works, the middle barrier up the Western corridor. So stay tuned. Okay, sir. That's what and I, I invited Bob. You didn't. We I have did. to. <laughs> we have to. Um, yes, ma'am. We have to approve the rail work that was done. Yes. 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 Inspect it. Yeah. Up close, but don't walk on the <laughs> don't walk on the tracks. An article about the walking in the tracks today. Yeah. Oh, was no. Maybe it was just right, right behind my mother's house. Somebody get hurt. Somebody get hit. Down no, the no, but just these time. really close. So right. Evidently, you don't hear these oh, really? trains coming. Yeah. Um, All right, yeah. but we'll, we'll work on that. Yeah. Where the people on the train didn't know if the person had been huh? going to drive. They won't let me drive. All right. Okay, so let me just get, if you've got your language out, and I think Anthea posted two two items, right? Mm -hmm. That are on today's web page. There are three things posted under my name. There is H262 is modified because Representative Smith has requested a number of modifications to it. And the differences from H262 are highlighted. So if anyone had like printed out H262 <laughs> or was that, it's sort of outdated at this point. Then there is the um, chart that I prepared a few years ago and then updated the last time you made changes to the distracted driving laws that sort of summarizes all of them in one place. And then there is what was originally the comparison between H-262 is introduced and current law in terms of what changes it would make. And I updated that to reflect the modified iteration of 262. So I don't know if it makes sense to talk around between the documents or to start with any of the charts. I will take my direction from there. Well, I'm thinking, we, I'm thinking, unless you, I didn't do an incredibly good job of make of blending just enough of this to bring us to, to a chart. But um, I guess we could start with the actual language. Okay. And are you working from 262 or are you working from I'm, modified? Version? I'm working from the distractive driving Rep Smith draft 1.1. Okay. Yeah, at 735. That's that that is what you should be working from. And I, that is what I will put up on the screen. Which of these three is that? That's the top one, I think. Thank you. The draft one one. Yes. So if you go to uh, our committee page. I went to uh, committees. I just got yeah, the committee page, but make sure it's the. the oh, I'm not sharing. I'm, I think, uh, I'm like, it's on the screen. You should be able to see it. <laughs> now it'll be on the okay. screen. Yeah, there you go. No, top, 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 top. Wednesday, right there, April 6th. Huh? Yeah, that one. Boom. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so it is Thank on the screen too. Okay, so to set the stage a little bit before we go through the language, there are four a collection of four statutes in Title 23 that are sort of considered to be like the distracted driving statutes. There's 1095A, which is the junior operator use of a portable electronic device. There's 23 BSI section 1095B, that's the handheld use of portable electronic devices because non-junior operators are allowed to use a device in non-enhanced free mode whereas a junior operator is not allowed to use a device even in hands-free mode. 1099, 23 VSA section 1099, is texting 
And then 23 VSA section 4125 is texting or handheld mobile telephone use by someone with a CDL. So that's why there are four distracted driving laws and why you'll see some changes made in multiple places. So Representative Smith's language that was introduced as 262 really just focused on making changes to the civil penalty and the point assessment structure for all four of those distracted driving laws. What the modified version does is it maintains all of that. It gave me the opportunity to update it to get rid of some gendered language. And it adds a concept of a diversion program and the ability to go to the diversion program for a first violation. And if you complete the diversion program and we'll get to that at the end, then it's zero points and a civil penalty of $1. So it preserves all of 262, adds some updates, non-substantive, just technical ones, and then creates a different route to um, dealing with your distracted driving violation for a first violation. It does not distinguish for that first violation between whether it was a violation of the statute in a school zone or a work zone. And the entire penalty structure that we'll look at as we go through the language and when we get to the charts, which I think is an easier way to see it all in one page, there is for everything except for the commercial one, a tiered structure where a first violation in a work zone is higher than a first violation outside of a work zone or a school zone. So there any questions before we get to the language? <laughs> no. I'm behind you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you I just didn't catch it. Um, the you said 1095A is junior, 1095B is handheld, non-junior. Uh, what's the next one that's just texting? Just texting. What is the oh 1099? 1099. And then the 10 VSA 41 is texting with CDL. Uh, 23 VSA 4125 is CDL violations. Okay. And then so the third commercial one you mentioned. Mentioned. The third one you mentioned is 10, 1099, 23 VSA section 1099. They're all in title 23. And if you look at um, the chart, the comparison one, they're all listed here. And if you look at the double pager, that's like the summary of the current distracted driving laws, they're all listed there. There's one row for each of them. Thank you. Nice. It has a little. Nice. Thank you. Uh, this is, um, and you can tell because like the formatting is a little different at the top. This is a Helena document that I have updated a couple times. So I do not get to take origination credit for that one in the slightest. Okay. So going to the language. Um, I have this drafted as if you could just like slot it into the miscellaneous motor vehicle bill as section 9A, so at the very end. Obviously, if you're going to be making substantial changes to the miscellaneous motor vehicle bill, I think you're gonna be dealing with a strike all amendment, um, in which case we can deal with all of the numbering, or it'll be a striking out the effective dates and inserting in lieu thereof, and we could make it be sections like 10, 11, 12, et cetera. The reason why I did it as 9A, 9B is because you have, to have your effective dates. So that's why the numbering scheme is a little weird here. But if this is language, or if a portion of this is language that ends up in the miscellaneous motor vehicle bill, we'll make sure that it is numbered in a less obscure way. So 1095A, these are your junior operators, use of portable electronic devices. And I can put up the statute so you can see all of it, like what it's saying is actually prohibited. But all that this would change is the civil penalties and the points. So under current law, and this is the language that you're going to see struck out, if you have a first violation in a outside a school zone or a work zone, and this is the language that we're getting in the beginning, it's an $100 minimum and a $200 maximum for that civil penalty. <clears throat> Rep. Smith's proposing to reduce that. So for a first violation outside a school zone or a work zone, instead of being a minimum of 100 and a maximum of 200, it's a minimum of 25 and a maximum of 50. This is the only one where Representative Smith is proposing to 
lower it, except for the CDL, which is a little different because that has a maximum and he's proposing a minimum. So this is your junior operators, first violation, outside work zone or school zone, reducing it from a range between 100 to 200 to a range between 25 and 50. Any yeah, questions? It's, yep, it's, Representative. It's um, if you mean the outside of school zone, do you mean outside of the school or outside of? Not zone within zone? a work zone or a school zone. Representative Bartholomew and Representative Smith. Why do we want to reduce this? What's the rationale? The rationale that is that a kid doesn't have any money. The parent's going to be responsible to pay the fine. And it probably, I don't, I don't, I didn't feel that it was fair for the parent to have to pay a hundred or two hundred dollar fine. And I think with a junior operator, they're going to be a lot more concerned about losing a license than the amount of money. So I, I didn't want to fine a parent for a child's problem. That was the reason for that. And I think that's a very good, just something that Representative Smith mentioned, which I'm going to refer back to the bottom part, the suspensions portion of this chart. Um, an adult operator who accumulates 10 points or more from traffic violations within a two year period is subject to a 10 day suspension with increasing suspension times for each additional five points. Learners permits and junior operators licenses are subject to a 90 day recall after six points are accumulated. So the consequence for a point accumulation for someone who is driving with a learner's permit or a junior operator's license is more severe than that same point for a um, someone who's operating <clears throat> under just a regular driver's license. Well, the points come next. Yeah, we'll, we'll deal with the points in the next subdivision. It just I would like to think about this, but I don't know if I like these numbers changes. I get some thought. Representative Smith, if you're done, Representative Bartholomew. I'm done. Yes, thanks. Okay, so next line, lines nine and ten. For a second or subsequent violation, again, this is going to be for a violation that is not within a work zone or a school zone, current law has a minimum of 250 and a maximum of 500. Under Representative Smith's proposal, that would be a minimum of 50 and a maximum of 75. So you are preserving the lower threshold but it is a little bit more dramatic in its reduction. Subdivision two, an individual convicted of violating this section shall have five points assessed against the individual's driving record. Under current law, it is two points for that first violation inside or outside. Sorry, it's a two points for that first violation not within a work zone or a school zone, or two points for a second violation, not within a school zone or a work zone. And you're gonna to say to me, Anthea, I don't see two points anywhere here. And I'm gonna say, well, that's because it doesn't say. So the default, and you'll see this in footnote one of the summary chart, is a lot of statutes will say within the statute itself, that this is the number of points that's assessed, like this would be doing with the five points. But then there's also this schedule of points in 23 VSA section 2502. And that is also a place you need to look for points. And we'll see in the language that is the update to H262 where we're um, making changes to that schedule of points. 23 VSA section 2502 A1 triple F provides that the default assessment is two points for a moving violation where nothing is included in statute. So there's nothing included in statute for 1095A for those violations that are outside a work zone, not within a work zone or not within a school zone. So those go to the default of two points. So that is why the chart is more helpful here because you don't need to think and look in multiple places to see is the subject to the default. So under Representative Smith's proposal, it would be going from a 
first violation, not within school zone, work zone, 100 to 200 range with two points, 2A25 to 50 with five points range. And then for the second violation, again, not within the work zone or the school zone, from a 250 to 500 range with two points to a 50 to $75 range with five <coughs> points. And that five points gets the junior operator awfully close to that six point threshold for a 90 day suspension. You will see in the chart that I have, and we'll get to this language later in the text, that I put a footnote at the end of the first violation explanation, because it is this first violation, not within a school zone or work zone, and it would be applicable for the first violation within the school zone or the work zone that would then be able to go to diversion. This is still first violation. Yeah, well, we're talking about first violation and second violation, not within a work zone or school zone. We we'll get to the language where you'll see that diversion is only available for the first violations without regard to the location of the violation. So right now, I'm, I'm going to assume uh, is to look at look at the the this chart or the more current, right? So if you're looking at this chart, what we've just talked about is outside school zone work zone first violation current law second violation outside school zone work zone current law and then in modified h 62 outside work zone school zone first violation and second violation and my footnote only applies to this little box right here so far this one yeah, yeah. okay I feel like i need a bingo blotter or something like <laughs> no, exactly. these are the boxes i'm trying to Nice job. Current law, modified, outside, inside, four squares, right? <laughs> Study it for a second. Anybody? Questions on the outside and okay. uh, points? Um, I don't know if there's a fiscal note on this yet. I was just wondering if anybody, or Representative Smith, if I wouldn't mind, or Anthea, the impact on your, like uh, your your um, auto insurance, and looking at looking at the the uh, the amount of money that you know the fine is one thing, but it's the auto insurance that having this amount of points would um, you know, we'll have to take a look at what that that impact just so we you know you're going to need to know what what that is especially on this junior junior one right i know that you had mentioned about parents i'm sure the auto that's, insurance is that's auto, yeah regardless of who gets the ticket or who gets the fine right uh, well that means like you were saying parents are paying they're they're yeah. they're going to be paying for themselves now and for you know yeah big deal Okay. Okay. So before we finish off um, section 9A, the other thing that you're getting with a lot of this language struck out on lines 16 to 21 is Representative Smith's proposal is stripping away the concept of the tiered approach just for the junior operators and just for the use of a handheld device for the deviation between outside school zone, inside school zone, outside work zone, inside work zone. And that's where you're getting this striping of all the language that says that it shall be this, it shall be um, this increased amount for these different zones. So going back to our chart, you'll see under the current law, when we're looking at our inside school work zones, that it's doubled for everything, so and it has higher points. So for a first violation inside a school zone or work zone, within a school zone or work zone, the range is 200 min to 400 max. That's a doubling of the 100 min, 200 max. And the points is four points for the first one. For a second violation within a school zone or work zone under current law, it's a 500 min doubling of the $250 min for the not within. and a uh, maximum of a thousand, and that has five points. Representative Smith's proposal maintains the structure that he has for the outside school or work zone to the within school zone work zone. So without regard to where the violation is, 
it's going to be for a first violation, minimum 25, maximum 55 points. Second violation without regard to location, minimum 50, maximum 75, five points. And that takes us through 1095A and Representative Smith's proposal I'm sorry. for a different approach. Representative Bartholomew, do you have your hand up? Yes. Um, you probably already said, what, what is a junior, junior operator? I didn't. Um, and we can go to... A junior operator's license may be issued initially only to persons who are 16 and 17 years of age, have passed the driver examination required in subchapter two of this chapter and a driver education and training course approved by the Commissioner of Motor Vehicles and the Secretary of Education, and have possessed a learner's permit for not less than one year, and they have submitted a form. They've maintained a driving record without a learner's permit, suspension, revocation, or recall for six consecutive months prior to licensure. And it requires um, the um, parent or guardian or a person standing in local parentis to file a written consent and it can be renewed. So 16 and 17 year olds. So it's someone who has a driver's license but beyond learners for me. Yeah. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I was just trying to okay. you know, figure out the, the, the penalties here, how we, you know, we lowered them, but my recollection, even though we have a, a number in there, the, the courts set like the waiver mm -hmm. the fine is actually going to be. So what's, when we're lowering these sort of like, what, would what is it actually doing to these? Because it's going to be different from what we think is going to be. Mm -hmm. So um, to scale things, um, and we can put up the waiver penalty chart, there is for your current structure, and if you look to the, the summary one, you'll get this. And I know this is updated to 2321, but I did check and the waiver penalties are consistent. And I know you haven't made any changes to the, the rest of it since then. So for that first offense, not within a school zone work zone where it's got the range of 100 minimum, 200 maximum, things to remember is that doesn't include your surcharges. So I think it's the $47 plus 15%. Yep. Um, and the waiver penalty does reflect that. And the waiver penalty for that $100 to $200 range, the Judicial Bureau has put that at $162. For that first offense within a work zone or school zone where you have the range under current law being between 200 and 400 they have set the waiver penalty at $277. So it seems like in those instances, it's slightly above the minimum. For the subsequent offenses where the not within a school zone or work zone range is 250 to 500, they put that one at 335. And the 500 to $1,000 range for a second or subsequent in two years within a school zone or work zone, that is at $622. That's on top of, or that's? That's in lieu of. So you can, instead of like, challenging it, you can just pay your one waiver penalty and be done with the whole thing. Yeah, so they're different on there. So that 25 will be more like, what, 35? Or I, mean, I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. I mean, so think when you think about the $25, that also has $47 tacked onto it. So yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, yeah, and then the 47 plus, plus the 15 yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you could end up having what you're actually paying. Yeah, so your waiver penalty might even look like it's larger than your maximum because it's factoring in the fees and surcharges that are not reflected in what you see on the page. So in addition to thinking about, well, what is someone actually going to have to pay as the waiver penalty? Also think, even if that person like takes this to fruition and they get the maximum, it also has a little bit more on top of it. And for those of you who are, who are on the committee, um, last biennium in like your first year when you change the um, inspection sticker language, like if you're pulled over without a valid inspection within like the first 14 days and you specifically said, and the surcharges and everything don't apply, because I think you reduced it to like $5. So the surcharges and 15% were gonna be like so much larger than what you wanted it to, to actually be. 
Brian, you don't know how many years that took to get that done. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> so just the waiver penalties. I don't think I'm understanding what exactly. I'm sorry to but no, no. Um, I think it'll make more sense if so we go to the you've district. got a fine. You got a fine, say $25, and then you've got waiver penalties. No, waiver penalty is in our if you want to do any of the others. Okay, tell me. So if you go to the Vermont Judiciary website and you go to the Judicial Bureau, all the way to the bottom, there's this waiver penalty schedule. So for every statute that goes to the Judicial Bureau, it's got the points that are assessed, which we're not in the motor vehicle ones, which is why you're not seeing points. Um, the code, the minimum, the maximum, and the waiver. So let's go to 1095. So, sort of right there in the, the middle, we got highlighted. So 1095A, junior use of portable electronic device in a work zone, first offense. You've got that it's four points. Its code is WZ44, WZ4. The minimum is $277. And you're like, but wait a minute, you told me that the minimum was $250. That is $277 because it has added onto it. That seems off for the 277. It seems like it's, it seems high. No, no, not that it seems high. It's that the, the percentage and the, the extra seems different. It should okay, be currently the current law is in, is that inside? Well, works. I think there is a inside work zone first offense is two hundred dollars minimum. Oh no, yep, yeah, this is totally right. It's two hundred dollars plus forty seven dollars plus fifteen percent of two hundred dollars. That's how you get your two hundred and seventy seven dollars, and your five hundred and seven dollars for the maximum. That's four hundred dollars oh, plus fifteen percent of four hundred dollars. Plus forty-seven dollars, and that's the total is considered the waiver penalty. No, the no. waiver penalty is what you would pay instead of. So you, instead of having a minimum, instead of having a maximum, instead of leaving it to the judicial bureau to um, give you a civil penalty in a range, you can just take your ticket, three hundred and ninety-two dollars. Okay, so you get you're thinking to yourself, I'm either going to get two two seventy-seven. Or if I'm lucky, or if I'm not lucky, I'm gonna get the, the full piece, which is five something. And actually, I do need to update this chart. I have I've found some errors with this. I will give you an updated version of okay. this chart. Okay. But that's where it comes. And then you can say, you know what, I don't want to, I don't feel lucky today. I think I'll take I'll take my chances at the waiver penalty, yeah, yeah. which is in the middle. Yeah. Um, all right. Remind me again how, when uh, licenses are suspended at how many points for a junior operator? Um, so it's recalled for 90 days after six points. Six points. Yeah. And it's recalled for 30 days after one texting conviction. And for a senior, a non junior operator, an adult operator, it's 10 days, a 10 day suspension for 10 points within a two year period. That's not me. It's under the suspension. Okay, yeah. And the points, I'm sorry. <laughs> Senator Bartholomew, go ahead. Just a 15%, $47. But what, what are those? So those are, do I have the sites here? Tag on the report that goes to certain funds. It's 13 VSA. I know how we can find it because we can go look at that inspection statute. I thought that was just a question. She's looking, I'm wondering how long does the point stay on your license? It kind of just roll. So the it's for a two year period. So like that look that. But I don't know like for purposes of insurance. I'm just telling you for statute and for the suspensions. So you've got to be careful for two years and you've got five points. You've got yeah, two years. You've got to be good. What's you your got, yeah. <laughs> Not one year. No more texting. Yeah. Okay, 13 BSA, section 7282. 
13 DSA. 13 DSA. Okay, so you weren't talking to it. I was, but I'm, I'm trying to get the um, answer for Representative Brett Balmies about this surcharges. I wanted to read all of Title 23 last summer. Mm -hmm. Okay. After page one. Until <laughs> 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 uh, August, yeah. So for purposes of the surcharges and everything, for any offense or violation committed after June 30th, 2013, forty-seven dollars, of which twenty-nine seventy-five shall be deposited in the victim's compensation special fund, end of which ten dollars shall be deposited into the domestic and sexual violence special fund. So $47, $29.75 goes to the Victims' Compensation Special Fund. $10 goes to the Domestic and Sexual Violence Special Fund. And I'm not sure where the balance goes. It doesn't say here. And then also, in addition to that, so that's the $47. And then in addition to that, the 15% is for any offense or violation committed after June 30th, 2003, so a different date, an amount equal to 15% of the fine imposed for the offense rounded upward to the nearest whole dollar which will be deposited into the Crime Victims Restitution Special Fund established by a section type. The minimum and maximum fine amounts and increases it by 47 plus 15. Yeah, so let's pretend that you had something that had a minimum of zero on the Judicial Bureau waiver penalty chart. It's going to give you a minimum of $47. That's why you see so many that say minimum $47 because that's 15% of zero plus 47. And why you see so many that are 1,197, because that's a minimum, uh, a maximum of 1,000 plus 15% of $1,150 plus 47. And if you're wondering why there are so many that are 47 and 1,197, it's because the statutory defaults are minimum is zero, maximum is 1,000. We're always impressed. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, do you want to move to 1095D? Are we ready? Okay. Okay, so now we're dealing with the non junior operator licenses. And then the one to remember here is that non junior operators are allowed to use a mobile phone in hands frame mode. <coughs> so for this, under current law, um, and this is on line 11, what you see struck out is, this, again, it's got that same $100 minimum, $200 maximum range. You're gonna see the 100 minimum, 200 maximum, the 250 minimum, the 500 maximum for the second violation and the doublings for the inside school zone and work zone. You're gonna see that a lot. And that's because in the 2019 miscellaneous motor vehicle bill, you made it so that 1095A, 1095B and 1099 all have the same structure to it. So if you're looking at this box, this box, and this box, you'll see that they're identical. This is not junior operator. This is not junior That's operator. Right. <clears throat> so under Representative Smith's proposal, H262 modified, he would only specify a minimum, not a range, and the minimum would be $250 for the first violation outside a school or work zone. And it would be $500 for inside a school or work zone. And again, those are minimums, no maximum is specified. So the default would be $1,000. For a second violation inside, outside a, or not within a school zone or a work zone, he has a minimum of 500, no maximum specified. And for the second violation, a minimum of 750, no maximum specified. His points escalate more here as well. So the um, current law is two points for the first violations. So two points for the first violation outside the school zone or work zone, and two points for the second violation outside the school zone or work zone. And then it's got the four points, five points for the ones within a school zone work zone. Under Representative Smith's proposal, a first violation not within a school zone or a work zone would be four points. A violation inside a school or work zone, that first violation would be nine points. A um, second violation not within a school zone or a work zone would be five points. 
and a second violation within a school zone or a work zone would be 10 points. And that hits your magic number of 10 points or more yielding a 10 day suspension. So under Representative Smith's proposal, if you were using your phone in non-hands-free mode in a school zone or a work zone for a second or subsequent time, that would get you the 10 points. If you think about the escalation and the way, the way that the, um, the counting is done, because your points would last for two years and it's a second or subsequent within two years, you really would have had 19 points at that point. So you're well beyond and probably would then be hitting a different suspension amount. Yeah, because your second violation would be within that time frame, correct? Otherwise it would be a first violation. Yes. So on your license then at that point you'd have 19. Basically, yeah. I think that's how I think that is how the math would have to work out. Yellowza. Better believe it. Is that a bar phone? You said seven hundred and fifty dollars somewhere in all of that, and I yep. don't see that number. Either. So that's because if you look in subdivision two, C two, you'll see an individual convicted of violating this section while operating within the following areas shall be subject to an additional civil penalty of two hundred and fifty dollars. She'll have an additional five points. Thank you. So you're not going to see seven fifty because so it's. Be, I could be math. Yes, and, and again, I, this chart is just way easier to see what's going on because there's so much that's being struck out and and to, to make what is really like just a lot of number of changes. Thank you. May I add something? Yes, sir. While we're while while she's going through all of this, keep in the back of your mind that in a school zone, if someone's driving thirty five miles an hour. The typing in a number, they can travel about 350 feet, and your son or grandson or granddaughter could be walking across the road. So, thank you, Anthea. I just wanted to add what that. you said. Rep John, Representative Bartholomew. Another question about school zones is this, is, this, um, is it only a school zone when the school is in session, or is it always a school zone? I believe it is always a school zone. Can I get back to you on that one? Oh, sure. yeah. Not on, not on um, State Route 100 or 107 in Pittsfield. When you go to school, it says 35 miles an hour when flashing. When flashing. Right, but it might always be a school zone. It might only have the reduced speed limit. So it's always a school zone, but there is, like, we can go up to 50. When it's it's not yeah, but I think Representative Bartholomew's question is. If there's no kids around the middle of the night, you're going through a school zone that you to go to these. Right. And I think you would be if it was a school zone. I also think if there is something that used to be a school zone and is no longer a school zone, but there, it's it, sorry, used to be a school zone, it's right. still a school zone, but there's no longer a school there, you would be subject to the increased civil penalty. And I believe there is at least, there are at least a few of those in the world. Mm. I think that also goes into, not that it's what we're taking up here, but there are certain people, people who have restrictions on them from being in a school zone. So it isn't just about the traveling. There is also being in the proximity of the building is like within the school zone, you're not allowed to step foot in. Or like a restraining order or something. Something of that nature, yeah, yeah. I know that. Here we think about it in the transportation and the car and the vehicle or something, but there's there's a lot of other things that I'm sure Anthony, that reference school zone for other so purposes. Okay, it's that stretch of 107 is in a school zone. How is a person supposed to get to work? Work and not enter a school zone. Mm. So maybe their offense is not within so many yards of the door within the school zone or something, you know? That's why we have so many lawyers. The long way around. That's why we have lots of lawyers to help solve those things. <laughs> and then do you even know? Pedophiles. Mm -hmm. They're not supposed to be pedophiles. Right. Right. But I mean, if well, he's driving, like he's not stopping, but he's the, driving the through. Driving on the state highway. Mm -hmm. 
So maybe they do have a certain footage away from something like that. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, I'll stop trying to find the answer. Okay, <laughs> while well, you're sitting here with me, okay, and I will get back to you. Um, okay, so that's going to take us through to section 9C. This is 1099, texting prohibited. Again, under current law, you've got that same structure for the first violation um, outside the, or not within the school zone work zone, 100, 200, two points. Inside, it's going to be doubling 200, 400, four points. And then for the second violations, within school zone work zone, 250 to 500 range with two points. The second violation, 500 to 1,000 with the five points. Um, for purposes of what Representative Smith is proposing, it would be identical to what you just saw in 1095B. So minimum specified, no maximums, starting at 250 and then doubling for the inside and then the 250 on top of that for the, the increase. And then you've got your same point structure, four points for outside school zone works on nine points for inside, and then five points, 10 points for the second violations. Nope, oh, go ahead, Representative. So uh, explain what the maximum would be. A thousand dollars on all, like a two Where it's blank. It's just the maximum would be. Yep. So instead of the second violation of 750, the, max the minimum, the maximum would be 1,000. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And that's because, um, do I have a citation to it? I might have to go look it up. But there is um, something in Title 23 that basically says that no maximum. Okay, so I know that it's, it's uh, when no, no minimum is specified, it's zero. Yeah. When no, no maximum is specified, it's one. Okay, thank you. Representative Bartholomew? About all the questions. <laughs> what, how is texting defined? Did you ask how texting is defined? Yes. Well, but you can text. Um, I'm sorry, that was using <laughs> Siri, right? If you're an adult. Can, can's free. Oh, yeah. If you're hands free, can't you just talk to your phone and say, Dictation. send my wife a text? So, is that texting? I will tell you what texting is. Texting prohibited. As used in this section, texting means the reading or the manual composing or sending of electronic communications, including text messages, instant messages, or emails using a portable electronic device, which is defined. Use of a global positioning or navigation system shall be governed by section 1095B of this type. And that's the one we just talked about, which is using your phone as a non-junior operator in non-hands-free mode. Just a key word is manual. You would have to yeah. like So why why do we have a separate texting section? Why wouldn't it be just all fall under prohibited um, handheld use? So two reasons. One, I asked that same question when I started, and I was told I think it was by Michelle or maybe it was by Commissioner Milley or some of DMV that they did not think it made sense to consolidate them from a statutory perspective. And I'm again going to refer to your different means of suspension. A learner's permit or junior operator's license is subject to a 30-day recall after one texting conviction. So from a policy perspective, it's saying if you are someone who's driving with a junior operator or learner, learner's permit, we don't really care how many points you get. You text once, 30-day 30 30-day recall. So I think if you really, truly wanted to treat using a phone to send a text message in the same way as using a phone to, for example, put in like an address that you're trying to, to get to in a GPS device, then you could get rid of 1099 and consolidate it down into 1095B. This is structured to very explicitly say and I use that as an example using the GPS, should be treated differently from texting and from a policy perspective in terms of recall for a junior operator learner's permit, texting is treated differently. There could be other um, distinctions that I would just need to go refresh my memory on, but that's the one that, that I remember and that is especially pertinent to the conversation that we're having now. And if you can totally disagree with the policy sentiment behind that, I'm doing good. Representative Shell. So I'm reading from CA for next. So that 
that, that language is outdated because today's cars, you don't need to manually compose a text message. You can do it verbally. Right, and I do not think that would violate the law. Correct. That would not violate the law. So you're still, manual. you're still texting. Exactly. So you're still not just, just for maybe future mm -hmm. conversation, but you're just still not concentrating on driving. You're still distracted because you're texting verbally. So if you wanted to treat texting verbally as something that you also wanted to regulate, I think that that is a, a policy um, approach that you could take. One of the things that I think would be very interesting for this committee to hear from law enforcement on is how do you figure out if someone was texting using their, like I pressed the button on my steering wheel and I said some text message to, to so-and-so. I don't know how um, law enforcement figures it out without just sort of visually seeing like, oh, it looked like someone was holding a phone in their lap and using it. Um, one of the bills that Representative Smith introduced last biennium had to do with a report on a textalizer, which is like the breathalyzer, but for cell phones. And there's technology supposedly out there at least two years ago when we were working on that yeah. bill. Where you, I haven't heard much about those lately. Though. Yeah, where you could plug your phone in and it's just supposed to be able to determine. Oh, it's this. not a conversation for this particular proposal, but it could be an interesting conversation later on. Uh, yeah, no, because then you'd just be banned in cell phone. I mean, you won't be able to talk in your car. Okay. With me. But we, I'm just saying it's the same thing. You'd never be able to use your yeah. hands free. The same. They would think I'd be texting. No. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you're going to go down that road, you basically ban in your, your cell phone in a car. I also believe it was two years ago there was a bill introduced by Representative Lalon that would have taken a broader um, perspective on what it meant to be driving distracted in that we're using it to say like you can't use your phone and 1095a has to do with like an operator looking at a, a video um device back i think when there were lots of like screens going into cars for the first time but you know are you distracted if you're eating a really really long sandwich i heard just in passing talking about distracted driving in the state house that someone once saw someone driving and playing the trombone at the same time are you distracted <laughs> when you're playing the trombone trombone i heard someone say they had like seen a trombone you think I mean, so should there be a different approach to distracted driving writ large and not ooh, kind of limiting the specifics of it to using your phone or a laptop or gets to like and reading the radio you still have a radio yeah or um eating or drinking you know it would be impossible to release uh, somebody that was doing uh, verbal texting. So you know, it's pretty much a non-starter, but it's an interesting conversation. I mean, yeah. police stop people now with their phone in their hands and they say, I'm not texting, I'm dialing. And uh, you know, there's nothing, That's different. nothing against That's dialing the phone in cars. Or, I'm going to check. It would be under 1095. Are they using the use of use? Okay. Oh, uh, I forgot about that. As used in this section, hands-free use means the use of a portable electronic device without use of either hand by employing an internal feature of or an attachment to the device. So under 1095B, you're prohibited from using a portable electronic device while operating a moving vehicle in a place that's open temporarily or permanently to public or general circulation vehicles. Um, if you are using it in the non hands free mode, yeah, it's a sticky wicket. It is, yeah. yeah. Representative McCormick is next. But. Um, Madam Chair, I just wanted to uh, full disclosure. I, when I was 17, 1969, driving my Volkswagen bus down Route 1 in California. <laughs> I want to think about that. Let me get an image of that. Yeah. I get like Reagan coming out <laughs> the group. I was pulled over by the police. We'll claim the harmonica. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we were just playing music and I was playing harmonica. And, um, I remember what the cop said. He, he didn't write me up. He just pulled me over and he came up to the car. He said, because I had New York plates, he said, driving in California is difficult enough with both hands on the wheel. No harmonica. <laughs> I bet your hair was more and longer then, yeah. wasn't it? 
he wasn't playing the trombone. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't do the trombone. Feels Sixth weird. position, that's really fun. I might have trouble with a tuba. So I'm going to suggest that we not try that on our right home. <laughs> you know, I don't know about you, because like, you know, sometimes I'm trying to change music, and I think, is this legal? <laughs> but, okay. Keep going, ma'am. Okay, so that has taken us through 1099, which will match 1095B. So, all right, so that's through that page. So here's, I have a question, because I, I don't know if we're there yet, but I'm sure because Representative Smith, when in discussing this with him, said you were working towards a warning. You, you had, you'd come to a softer, you know, stop and a warning and an education piece. Is that, are we coming? That's in, that? It's coming? Yeah. Okay, because that, that wasn't feeling, that wasn't feeling very warning. <laughs> Okay, so section 90, this would be changing the penalty structure for um, the commercial driver's license one in 23 VSA section 4125. So Representative Smith's proposed language, instead of it being silent on both the civil penalty and the point assessment, so it defaults to the 1,000 maximum two points, he would specify a minimum, which then gives you your range of 500 to 1,000, five points for um, outside, not within a work zone, school zone, um, 10 points for inside a school zone, work zone. And he has the minimums being the same for the two, 500 for each. Okay, so this is when I said how there's that schedule of points in 23 VSA section 2502. This is just updating that schedule of points to reflect the changes that we just talked about earlier. So I'm not gonna go through that, but you'll see. Um, that like four points, we've got the handheld use of portable electronic device outside work or school zone first violation, and it's got the citation for the statute. It's a pretty handy um, table. Um, that is going to take you from the top of page six all the way through to the top of page nine. And it's going to take you to all of the yellow language, which is new. This was not included in H-262. And this is the Distracted Driver Diversion Program. And this is mostly modeled off of 18 VSA Section 4230B, which is the diversion program for the possession of cannabis if you're between 16 and 21. So 18, 18 VSA Section Four two three zero B is like part of the section number, so not in the parentheses. Yeah, and that's for the possession of cannabis between sixteen and twenty-one. This is one of thirty B. This is one of the many diversion programs that exists. There is not currently, and I heard you talking about this yesterday. There's not currently a diversion program for distracted driving. There is a diversion program for driver's license suspensions, I believe. I think that's the only okay. Okay. so there's a okay. distracted driving diversion program that was where i had a question yesterday for the for representative smith was like does that exist it does not it does not it exist. does not this would be creating it all underlined all new language all right well let's hear how we going to create something okay so for a law enforcement officer who is um, pull someone over for a first violation of 1095A, B, or 1099 without regard to the location, will issue a notice of violation on a form approved by the court administrator. The notice of violation shall require the individual to provide the individual's name and address and shall explain procedures under this section. And that explanation needs to include that the individual needs to contact the diversion program in the county where the offense occurred within 15 days. That failure to contact the diversion program within 15 days will result in the case being referred to the Judicial Bureau, where the individual if found liable for the violation may be subject to one or more of the following, a civil penalty, points in position, the suspensions of, suspension of the license, or substantially increased insurance rates. No money, this is again the direction that's being given to the person with the uh, notice of violation, 
that no money should be submitted to pay any penalty until after adjudication, and that the individual needs to notify the diversion program if the individual's address changes. So do we have to create the diversion program first before we dare you to contact them? I think Mark Anderson will address that. Uh, we spoke briefly on it, and he has, I believe, he has some ideas about how to go about doing this because there is funding available in the diversion program already that can be used for other projects. And I could be wrong in what I'm saying, but I'd rather have him here tomorrow explaining that, whether it's fact or fiction. I think you'll also want to hear from the judiciary. Yes. On the court well, that's what I wrote in the, yeah, the judicial. And you might want to hear from the AG's office. <clears throat> the AG's office I had on my list too when I saw their name coming up. All right, so right now, this would be saying on your first violation of either A, B, or 99, notice the violation shall require individuals to provide the individual's name of a, and shall explain the procedures under this section, including, all right, so that's where we're at. Representative Burke, did I see your hand up? I, I just, was going to ask about the diversion program, but it sounds like we'll hear about it. Okay. And I, for the summons and complaint, I, we would need to hear from law enforcement to, it might be that they don't complete a summons and complaint. It might be a civil violation that's completed. So summons and complaint might need to change. But that's something that law enforcement can, or the court administrator can help us on. I just, I, I think that maybe just now that I'm thinking about it, I think the summons and complaint might not be the correct phrasing. But the premise, the concept is that the law enforcement completes the document that would lead to the Judicial Bureau adjudicating the violation, but it shall not be filed with the Judicial Bureau at the time of the violation. So I'm back on page nine still, sorry. Oh. <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm on page 10. 10. Thank you. Um, so that might, subsection D probably needs to get reworked if this moves forward, but the, the, the structure is that instead of the ticket or whatever document is filled out going to the Judicial Bureau, it's completed and then held to give the individual time to go and commence the process of registering with and participating in the diversion program. And these are electronic? I don't know. They might be paper, they, I, 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 I don't know. Yeah, so then I have a question. This week. What triggers the 15 days or from, from the time that it's filed or becomes a part of? Well, the um, the notice of violation is issued and it's probably then sent to the diversion program. So, so diversion program would have to receive this, a, a trigger. No, no, one yeah, it's a bad word because it, it's sent to the it is sort of a trigger, it's sent to the diversion program within and 15, that's days. 15 days. Yeah, so you have your violation, your alleged violation, you're pulled over, sign of the road, you've got a piece of paper that starts your 15 days within, five. and this is, yeah, okay, so that starts the 15 days. I'm, I'm just because of, of I know paperwork wise, so that person would be potentially calling diversion. Let's just say they're really wanna get with it and they call within two days to say, diversion, I need to schedule. And they go, I haven't, I don't have any paperwork on you. So it might take more than two weeks to just get from the side of the street paperwork wise. That was why I asked if it was the time to get to diversion that you'd be calling on. Maybe we need 90 days like you told me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, you know what I mean? Because I could just, that, yeah. it's the logistics of the process. So the logistics of the process could be that this is already something that is sorted out within the diversion program. And it's not, oh, I'm in the wrong one. That's not something that you need to reinvent the wheel on. Right. So let's see what the, um, so yeah, you've got subsection uh, inventing any wheel at this at this point, but you know, but yeah, the, the places where it works because it already is a part of the the system. Then so it's good. This language, the 15 days, the summons and complaint, 
the issuance of notice a violation that is almost verbatim from the uh, cannabis diversion program. So to the extent that it could be a problem of getting the paperwork where it needs to be, it is a problem that I think has maybe been figured out yeah. in existing diversion programs. Okay, I just wanna make, yeah, thank you. So the, so the cannabis diversion program is the only one right now that has that particular- I don't know, I just know that, on that. This, is a, this was a more recently developed one. So the last time that I was working on a diversion program and I asked someone on the judiciary team, which one should I model it off of? This one was suggested and that is why I modeled this one off of it for Representative Smith. Thank you. So I did have on here a little list that was, when I mentioned, when I read this, I, I just want to make sure that I, like we would need to hear from the diversion program. I think there are a lot of people you need to hear from to figure out if the logistics of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So within that 15 days, I'm in subsection C. The um, individual who received the notice of violation needs to contact the diversion program in the county where the violation occurred and register for the distracted driving diversion program. It could be that maybe it doesn't make sense for it to be in the county that the violation occurred. Maybe it should be in the county that they live in. So something to think about. If the individual fails to do so to contact the diversion program um, and register, then the diversion program files a summons and complaint with the Judicial Bureau for adjudication under 4 BSA chapter 29. That's the chapter that covers the Judicial Bureau's jurisdiction. The diversion program shall provide a copy of the summons and complaint to the law enforcement officer who issued the notice of violation and shall provide two copies to the individual charged with the violation. And I believe that is all taken verbatim or give or take verbatim from the cannabis diversion program. Notice to report to diversion program. So upon receipt from the law enforcement officer of a summons and complaint completed under subsection B of the section, the diversion program shall send the individual a notice to report to the diversion program and meet with diversion program staff to assess the individual's risk for future traffic violations, identify factors that contributed to previous traffic violations. So this is broader than just the one traffic violation, handheld device or device in non-hands-free mode or texting. Um, develop a contract to be presented to the Judicial Bureau for review that may include more one or more of the following, completion of a driving education program approved by the <laughs> State Highway Safety Office, any other conditions related to the distracted driving traffic violation or a fee, not to exceed $500 in the case of a violation of Section 1095A, that's the junior operator one, or not to exceed $100 in the case of a violation of 1095B or 1099. I believe the Diversion program for cannabis does not have a fee associated with it, but the driver's license suspension one has a fee, and I think that fee might be quite large. So this is a fairly small fee in the grand scheme of things, but it probably is um, larger. No, it would. It, it is larger than the minimums for the. 1095A ones, but remember there wouldn't be points, which is important there, but it's probably not large enough to cover the cost of- That's what I was just writing. Like, we have no idea because we don't know what this would be uh, as to a fee is to cover the cost of the actual program. And when we don't have a program, we don't know how much we would should or could charge for it. Okay. Yeah. The version program, did you say has a hefty fee? I think it might be the driver's license suspension diversion program. Okay, thank you. This is driver's, and that's with suspension fee. Or driver's license suspension. So while you're looking, when I when I was reading this through, I made notes on the side. So as I just come down from, okay, let's just say there's a diversion program, which we don't have one yet, but if there was one there, the person, I'm at the diversion office, single, I'm registered, so I'm going to get this violation, person's going to call me, they're going to schedule time with me, and I have to one, assess the individual's risk for future traffic violation. How, who, if we work with the, what is, 
how do you assess that? And is there a best practice sort of like if you, you know, I don't know how that would, how that person, if there's no, anyway, that would be a question. How, how they would assess future risk or what they would use for an assessment tool. You know, there's, there are bona fide assessment tools to determine whether or not you're, right, if you, you know, have got, if you, if you're at risk for, you know, alcohol abuse or, or other things, that there's a, there's the MAZI test and other things that are standardized tests for that process. I don't know how, I don't, so that would be a big one, Representative Smith, of what is the tool that assesses, who's, do they have to be qualified to give that assessment? then identifying factors that contributed to previous traffic violations. That's, that's a biggie. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, what is the MAZI test? Oh, that's, that's one of, there's- It's a walking the straight line or? No, 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 no. It's, no, it's like if, you, if you've been referred and you might answer, I think it's like 30, 30 I think it's MAZI, I could be wrong. It's a tool like through alcohol and drug counselors might choose as one of their variety on behavioral cognitive therapy type. Oh, things. so it's, you're it's not talking test. about a roadside. No, test. I'm talking about so this person's okay. coming in to get assessed. Okay. So if you're getting assessed, you might answer 15 questions like, hey, have you driven lately with someone who's been drinking? Have you, you, know, you might get assessed a quick assessment that says, you know what, you might have some risk factors here that you might want to go to the next deeper mm. kind of evaluation. So there are tools for that. That makes sense. That are scientifically the state uses not just not just the Diane Lanfer. Let me see the palm of your hand. The palm of your hand looks your like numbers. you're in trouble. <laughs> That's the one my kids don't like. Maybe I guess the Lanfer test. test. The Lanfer yes. test. Anyway, so th those would be those are going to be tough. Those those would have to be well I know we'll find out. And then contributing to previous traffic violations. That's interesting. I would all right and then develop a, a well the Judicial Bureau developing. Well, I'm thinking we can get those questions answered tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, I'm, you know, because that's those yeah. are the questions that I start, just so you know, yeah. that's how I tear, I don't tear something apart because I want to tear it down. I tear it apart because we're putting in place law and we're putting in place a system that state employees have to follow based on our work. Correct. And if we're not, we, we, we can, at the best of intentions, we create some gaps going on. Oh, no, didn't see that one. Okay, we need to fix it, you know? Cool. So is the most that we can do, this is why I say that it takes a lot of testimony and development because we don't even have the diversion program yet. But, okay, so, so go ahead, ma'am. Like with lots of legislation, you are creating a framework and then needing to leave it to, in this case, the diversion program to, to, to flesh out the details. And you can be much more prescri prescriptive than there is here. Um, for purposes of Representative McCoy's question, the driver's license suspension um, diversion program has a down payment of $25 towards the program fee of $300. The balance of the fee is included in the payment plan and may be reduced based on a person's financial situation. But a lot of people who um, I think use the driving license for, driving with license suspended BLS program, it's because of failing to pay tickets leading to. Okay, so it's suspension. Yeah, okay. um, but there is a, a, a Vermont Court Diversion website. It's, it's got websites for a lot of them. I, I think mm -hmm. talking to the diversion program or someone from it will be very, very helpful. And I will be the first to admit that with the limited guidance that I think Sheriff Anderson and Representative Smith could give me in terms of just sort of getting a, a skeletal structure onto a page. There is so many more details that could yeah. be filled in. And then it is up to you as the, the legislators and the ones that are figuring out the policy behind this as to how many details you want to fill in, how much you want to just sort of leave it to the diversion program to figure it out. Well, then we would want to make sure that statewide it's being implemented in the same way. And only because of past history, you know, those diversion programs and any of the judicial pieces of our state system are very, very understaffed and very stressed for dollars as well. So I was, I just wrote down here, what's the number of staff they would need in order to fulfill this mission, you know, and 
to actually be able to develop it and implement it. So that would be a question I don't know, you know, but they would have to figure that one out. So this is where Representative Smith is gonna take people and dollars and instruction. All right. Not that I don't like, I just, I just wanna be realistic about what, what this is involved. There's the, yeah, we've got, uh, yeah, the Addison County Court Diversion Program is the capacity. the capacity to be able to do this and the dollars, even if they, even if they had dollars, the, the staffing capacity to do this. I do believe they have a lot of volunteers that go behind it, whether that's good or bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. and if it's anything in this world right now, the volunteers like are tough to come by. Very, very tough to come by. Okay, we're almost done with this. Okay. Uh, so that fee um, goes into the special fund that's created in the next section. Um, referral to the Judicial Bureau. So if an individual issued a notice of violation under subsection A does not satisfactorily comply, comply with the diversion program contract or any other conditions, then the diversion program filed the summons and complaint that was previously completed with the Judicial Bureau and it's adjudicated. And then it has the, um, <coughs> the same language about providing a copy of the summons complaint to the law enforcement officer and copies to the individual charged with the violation. Subsection G is satisfactory compliance with the diversion program. So if the individual complies with the diversion program contract that's entered into above and other conditions, then the individual is convicted of the traffic violation, but is only subject to a civil penalty of $1 and no assessment of points. This was something that came from talking to Sheriff Anderson, where you would still want kind of the, the marking of the fact that there was this prior violation. So you have the escalation to the second or subsequent in some of the other diversion programs. It's basically like ripped up and thrown away as if it hadn't happened. I don't know, and this would be an interesting question from the insurance perspective, how having that violation, even though it only has a civil penalty of a dollar and no assessment of points, what that would do to your insurance, and if that's balanced out by the fact that to get to that point, you would have had to, as part of the terms of your contract through diversion, to have gone through a distracted driving course. And then you're still convicted. And you're still convicted. But in a lot of times, you can, you know, have as part of either just choosing to get your insurance lowered, you can do um, a driving course, or I believe sometimes it would be a conviction of a plea related to <clears throat> violations. So again, I think that would be something that's interesting to hear from your sheriff's department, your um, district attorneys or talk your state's attorneys um, about how that comes into play in terms of whether or not people are, are given that as a requirement of a plea. Excellent. And then a piece. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me, this piece here, because we're asking people to go through the first program to change it, change it. And then we're still going to find them a dollar. Yep. You know, the people will not go through the diversion program because they don't want to worry because of the dollar. It's not the money, it's the, it's the mark on the license. The mark. So what it is is that it's you you complete it, you do everything you're supposed to, and you are still convicted of a traffic yeah. violation. Right. So right. this well, just my experience in a, another committee, criminals will go to jail and do the time rather than pay the fine. A dollar. Yeah. Oh, no matter what. The because it's a mark. It's a mark. It's for us. So they would, so, you know, they could maybe face a fine. They could get a reduction in, reduction in sentence if they did this and this, and did other things. And they would just say, no, let's do the time. And, you know, they, they would we'd arrest somebody and they'd get, uh, be in, they'd be in on bail and they would not want to get out because they're getting, they're getting credit for the time they served uh, prior to their, Adjudication, so they'd rather just stay in jail. And this, this, is, it's a dollar, but it sparks a lot of uh, interest in me uh, for that same thing. You're still penalizing the person for going through the program. I guess that's my, I thought. And I think if it would be possible, 
And I think this would be a question for either law enforcement or the judiciary to have a, because otherwise you could end up in this sort of circular loop where you keep getting convicted of a first violation and then you can go through diversion. Maybe that's something that would be ferreted out with this assessment of your You past. could like go five times. <laughs> yeah. So, but there's suppose, what Sheriff Anderson was trying to get at with this idea, and this was Sheriff Anderson's idea about the $1, was to kind of just create a, like a mark that then makes it so that you can know if there was that second or subsequent violation in two years. If there would be a way to do it without the conviction, I think you could accomplish the same goal, but could it be a second or subsequent within two years if there hadn't been that prior conviction? And do you need the prior conviction to make it so that you can do a second or subsequent? Maybe you address it by saying, very much thinking out loud here, this is not something that um, Sheriff Anderson directed me to, to do on behalf of Representative Smith. You only can participate in diversion once. And you do it based on the record if there is one of having participated in diversion. So yes, maybe you get your clean record thrown away by participating, but the next first you get is not one that would be diversion eligible. And then that would be the one that would start the clock for your second in a two year or your second on subsequent. Mm -hmm. I think you need to think about it and hear from a lot of people who know a lot more about this than I do. All right, we've got, we've got about a week and a half. We're good. <laughs> okay. okay, so special fund, oh, sorry, appeals, um, they would go under Rule 75, which is one of the two rules of um, civil procedure that have governmental review. <laughs> and Rule 75 is legislative. I know. Oh, what? What I was, I was like, I <laughs> Okay. Um, and then you've got the creation of um, the Distracted Driving Diversion Program Special Fund, which I think does not have a lot of money in it because it's just those 50 or $100 fees. And then 9H to get the ball rolling. The Vermont, can I, can I just, because when I read that too, it was like, okay, so what I just, you know, the, the idea of, of more funds, as you've seen, is, is a tough one to get through at any, at any, at any point is to, to create a new fund. But, the, but when I said this fund shall be available to the attorney general to enter into memorandums of understanding with diversion programs to pay for contractual and operating expenses and bubble, all I can think of is, all right, so the attorney general needs to be involved. He has to have, he or she has to have staff and, and or the authority given to them to enter into these memorandums. I don't know if they need legislative authority to actually be able to enter into and expend these funds, which would be a part of their, right? They, they can't just go, I have, you have access to this without authority to use it and under what circumstances. So all of that would need to have to be spelled out, right? And the attorney general would have to say, I don't, what's your capacity? I know that they are, they struggle with just like everybody else. What is their time frame? Uh, uh, or commitment, workforce pressure in order to do all of that. Okay. Um, and I would not have gotten that. Um, and that's where I wrote, that's, those are the notes that I write myself on the side when I read it, because I start to see the logistics of, okay, this person's gonna need, they can't, they don't just get, they have to have authority and under what circumstances and who are they contracting with? And what are the um, the parameters for them to contract from? Or, you know. And that language could be um, duplicated from a special fund related to a diversion program. And I can go and figure out if that's where it was pulled from. But that would be a ways and means. Ways and means would have to create this fund. Um, appropriations would have to. I, I think this would have to go to ways and means. It has to go to ways and means and then appropriations. I think you're going to need to appropriate money to yeah. cover the diversion program. Right. Two. So, yeah. unless the, it, there's information, unless there's capacity in the diversion program already. But no authority for them to be able to use those funds in this capacity. So they would. I don't know about the authority for diversion programs to exist. It could be that they are 
authorized to use money for the diversion program, then this would be covered as part of that diversion program. I'm just saying that I don't I don't think the diversion program, knowing them have asking every year for more and more money and not getting it has capacity beyond what they actually are doing for work right now. I don't think there's anybody in state government gets it by today that would say, oh, not a problem. I got a couple, three, four hundred thousand dollars for the next year to be able to take this on. They would they would they would need us to be able to provide them with that authority and um, workforce. Yeah, we got what, half an hour? Sorry, how close are we? Oh, you're almost yeah. closer. Okay, so you would need to have um, the Vermont State Highway Safety Office consult with the Department of Public Safety and the Vermont Sheriff's Association to approve at least one driving education program that's sufficient for the diversion program requirements in each county within the state by January 1 of 2023. And then you just have the language updating the recall of the um, learner's permit or junior operator's license. Remember how I said that it was one texting violation would yield to um, a 30 days and 90 days for a single speeding. I didn't mention the single speeding violation because it wasn't applicable here. So this would instead be um, and I'm on the top of page 14. This was in H262 as Representative Smith introduced it. If um, there is a total of at least three points, then it's a 30 day suspension and six points for a 90 day suspension. So getting rid of the concept of, or a recall, getting rid of the concept of one texting violation leads to a 30 day recall, six points leads to a 90 day recall. This would be three points, 30 days, six points, 90 days. So it's all a suspension. It's the equivalent of a suspension for those licensors. And that's it. That's the end of the language. Okay. The diversion program being the really big new piece. The changing the points and the civil penalties, that is very straightforward. It's something this committee has done possibly twice since I've been here, maybe yeah. just once. Um, so that puts a lot, a lot more straightforward and within the, I think, wheelhouse of the transportation committee. I think when you're getting to diversion, you are getting to other committees, other parts of state government, and it's something new. And it is also something that I, as the drafter, did not really have um, the, the base knowledge to put a lot of color to and need more guidance in the drafting of that if you do want more color to go to it and to actually enact it. Yeah, because when something is, when you're creating something from brand new, it really takes a lot of words. <laughs> takes a lot of words. <laughs> Representative Burke. I was going to say, also, also the money. We don't know what the... Yeah. And exactly, and now, but okay, so you, I, you know, in, in every county, so start, I start to imagine, all right, so you've got, you've got to set this up, they have to be paid. But there, I believe there already is a diversion program in every county, so that would be a question as to whether or not you're making a new diversion program in each county, or just having each diversion program that already exists have, have a driver additional. education program, so they would have to have within each county a new driver education program stood up in their county, in their diversion program. It could be up in there. So they're gonna need money to do that. And they're gonna need authority and direction. And what is a driver education program? So it's like, what would be, well, which maybe they can tell us um, what it is. So I, 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 that's a lot of dollars. And then what if they only get- It may not be a lot of dollars. The diversion is already established in all yeah. the counties. So an add to that program might not be a tough, tough nothing's cheap. Nothing's cheap, uh, yeah. Yeah, so a driver education program. So let's just imagine if you were tasked with, come up tomorrow and tomorrow you're gonna have in this room, you're gonna need to have add to your array of things, a driver education program on texting. Cool. So you're gonna need to go get a program to be able to understand what you're gonna implement. So 
the diversion program would, as part of the contract, say you need to go <laughs> participate in this program. The diversion program wouldn't necessarily need to create the program. And what you have is oh, scroll too fast. I would say the curriculum. They would need to create the curriculum or whatever it is when it says associates shall approve at least one driver education program. So and that's going to the Mount State Highway Safety Office is approving it, not the diversion. Program. So they would have to approve a program. Then I just ask one of the, let, let's just say I live, I'm just picking on Indiana today. Yes. I just live in Indi Indiana. Maybe, maybe and I'm here. here from Florida. <laughs> Florida. Florida, I may, you know, that's, that's looking better and better every day. Um, <laughs> you don't have to participate in diversion. Oh. Yeah. It's entirely voluntary. Okay. So I was just going to say, like, if, if you're not a Vermonter, mm -hmm. you're not going to have access to this easily. But you would have access. You might, you might have access. It's like I'm here, like a college student is here. It may not be, well, they're a resident at that point. All right, I'm just kicking things around, kicking lots of things around. We got lots to do. So the warning, where's the warning? The warning is pull over and just said. There isn't a warning. There is In this language, there's not a warning. Should there be? No, there's not a warning in any Okay, okay, I'll be, I'll be good. All right, so that's a lot to chew on. It'll it'll definitely fill our calendar. <laughs> so, yes, sir. I don't want to kill uh, Representative Smith's baby. I know. It's uh, after being downstairs this morning and, and watching the Senate and seeing what they're doing and what they're talking about, I'm not sure they have the bandwidth in the next two weeks to get anything done. Period. But. Uh, this is a uh, this is a great idea. I like it, but it's a major undertaking. And, and we're talking about putting it in a miscellaneous D and B bill. And I don't think that they would take this up at all. Just a personal yes, reaction to the amount of testimony required uh, and, and those type of things. I, I think they would be hard pressed. So I had a conversation with last night with. Uh, Representative Smith about them, thinking about this in a, just maybe a little different way of how we get this at least kicked off the top of the stump. I'm sorry, that's not a transportation metaphor, but, uh, but we'll have to go with that. Uh, and, and not lose thought and not lose the emphasis that the committee seems, seems to have for this. So I think we should continue to take testimony on it mm. with. Uh, it was your number. One, it was your number one choice. Yeah, but the thought behind this is how can we not lose this, or maybe not lose this thought, and, and continue the conversation on a little later on. So, uh, frankly, I, I, my, my, my personal feeling is if we put this in the miscellaneous DMV bill, we'll never see a miscellaneous DMV bill again. <laughs> I say well, if we put this in a miscellaneous D and bill, we'll never see it again. No. They'll either strike it or they just will bury the miscellaneous D and bill if there's too much in it for, for, for them to grasp. Take uh, on. Yeah. I don't think it's a complicated bill. Uh, uh, if, if it's read. Uh, uh, and if Mark Anderson can sit here tomorrow and say, yes, there is a diversion program. It's very simple to uh, structure. If that's the case, great. If it isn't, then we'll see where it goes from there. Well, I think, I think you've done, you've, you've made some modifications. I, um, but I, yeah, I do, I don't see it's my, my concern is, is just in the logistics and the timing and the, and the size and the dollars that it would take. To get it done, but I'm but the committee has this is your number one choice, so we'll we'll do our due diligence with it, Representative White. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to say speaker? <laughs> no. Uh, uh, I you know I I really do think that this is because it's the committee's number one choice because Representative Smith has spent such an, an amount of time on this. I do hope that we have it in the DMV miscellaneous bill. If there is an opportunity to um, to make that known to the Senate in a more public way, like to get a temperature check, I understand there are 
conversations that are happening, but I do think it's important for, especially the folks that you're working with, to know who they need to advocate to, to make a case for this, this language. So if there are specific angles that we should be working, um, I would love to have those be transparent where possible so that we have sure. the people who care about this be able to speak to the correct people. Well, when um, Representative Shaw and I met with uh, Senator Mazza, as we do at this point of the year, you know, and staying in communication with the speaker on this as to like, where are we with bills? How, you know, um, there's a lot of coordination between the House and the Senate at pay grades way above mine and, and thus that are coming to an end point. Okay, so um, I think we're, we're, we're working towards, meaning the whole house is working towards like a week and a half of having, we're, we're here of being done with this somewhere in there. So, I mean, we can take, I, I don't, I just wanted to point out that this is gonna take a lot of testimony and a lot of uh, opportunity with other, other committees as well to, to get to get to this, get to get through this. Um, and as we have conversations with the Senate, this is our job is to, to let them know. And, and we have uh, okay. had discussions with the Senate, my counterpart in the Senate around what are the, uh, this committee's top three picks for the DMB bill and have, and have made that known. Good. Thank you. That's what we do, that's our job. I think Anthea, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Anthea. And if you can think of anybody else that besides things that we've, we've got going on here, great. And that's perfect timing. Rarely are we this good. And I don't think I will see you tomorrow until the afternoon, right? Is that still happening? Right. You are. The light on head stuff. Okay, one o'clock. I'm looking at my pencil. Like, we had this whole plan out. Friday night and Monday was perfect, and well, almost perfect. And then, and then people were like, no, we don't have opinion. We don't need to come in. So we had some holes. So we rearranged the schedule with a lot of, a lot of uh, jumping around. And, um, I do appreciate both Anthea and Lori's and the committee's patience with with trying to maximize our time at the same time trying to make sure we can get the people. We need. All right, see you tomorrow. Anthea and others now as the Senate closes probably the last week of April here. Yeah. Yeah. So today's our big day. All right. So if you've got I know you're working with ANR, you're yes, working, yep. you've got things, That's everybody's okay. working. Those are the main three, and we'll hear from the sunset piece.